uh, speaking on the uh, anatomy and biomechanics of the knee, uh, only that part which is relevant to total knee replacement, not the whole part. Yeah. So, surgical anatomy and biomechanics of the knee which is relevant to total knee replacement. So, before we move on to that, let's understand what are the basic principles of knee replacement for which, uh, in the context of which we will be understanding the anatomy and biomechanics. So, we need to establish a normal mechanical axis, uh, we need to correct the deformity, establish uh, soft tissue balance in coronal and sagittal planes and restore the joint line and patellar height and most important to achieve equal flexion and extension gaps. Uh, so, we know that the knee has uh, six degrees of freedom, uh, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, uh, internal and external rotation and there is one more which is anterior posterior glide which is sort of neglected and not taken into consideration so often. Now, this probably is the most important uh, aspect of the anatomy of the knee joint, the articulating surfaces of the distal femur and the proximal tibia because it is here that everything uh, starts. So, uh, I don't know if I can. Yeah. So, if, if you see the, uh, can I have a laser pointer please? So, there is a discrepancy in the shape of the medial and the lateral condyle. The medial condyle as we can see is broader, more convex and bigger, but it is shorter in the AP dimensions, whereas the lateral condyle is thinner and longer in the AP dimensions. Uh, and if you see in the coronal uh, plane, the medial condyle projects more distally as compared to the lateral condyle. And Correspondingly, on the tibial side, we have a deeper medial condyle to accommodate the uh, big uh, uh, medial condyle and a flatter and a shallower lateral condyle in, which is in correspondence to the flat uh, lateral condyle on the femoral side. Now, and on top of that, the medial meniscus is less mobile and more uh, stable as compared to the lateral meniscus which is more mobile and uh, allows more freedom of motion. If you see the, uh, now the blue circles are the, uh, uh, represent the radius of curvature of the distal condyle. Uh -huh. So the, okay, sorry. I don't think this is working. So anyway. So the blue circle represents the radius of curvature of the distal condyle and the red, uh, red circle represents the radius of curvature of the posterior condyle. Now, the first image is on the lateral side, this is the medial side. If you see the difference in the radius of curvature of the distal and the posterior is quite significant, but if you see the medial side, they are more or less close to each other. Now, all this, what does it result in? It results in the medial side which is less mobile and a lateral side which is more mobile. And because of which the medial side acts like a pivot and the uh, uh, anterior posterior glide, the internal external rotation, all that motion happens more on the lateral side. The flexion axis of the knee is not the same. So, if you see the uh, center of rotations at 0, 20 and there on, therefore, if you plot the center of rotations at various degrees of flexion and then you draw the line uh, matching all of that, you will see that it is a J shaped curve of flexion. Uh, the quadriceps mechanism is important for two from the point of view of exposure and point of view of the patellofemoral mechanics. If there is one muscle that is most important for patellofemoral mechanics, it is the vastus medialis obliquus. And uh, depending on what exposure you take, so if you take a subvastus or you take a midvastus or you take a medial parapatellar, all that influences your patellar tracking later on. Uh, patellofemoral joint, one of the least understood and the most complicated aspect of the knee. Uh, is uh, in which the important parameters are the Q angle which we all know and the uh, Q angle uh, that uh, we will have at the end of a total knee replacement depends on the femoral and the tibial rotation. Getting the Q angle as close as possible to normal is important uh, because that is what determines the patellofemoral kinematics. Just to highlight that the normal Q angle is around 13 degrees. Now, uh, I don't, this slide may not be very clear, but what is important to understand, we often say that this structure causes this function and that structure causes that function. It's important to understand that no single structure works in isolation. So, if you say anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate, besides doing their respective duties of anterior and posterior stability, they also provide two important things. One is the rotational stability for the knee and also the, they resist the hyperextension in the knee. 
Similarly, the collaterals, besides doing their respective job of uh, providing varus and valgus stability, they also prevent the hyperextension of the knee. Posterior capsule does only one job that prevents, uh, maintains the extension gap and prevents hyperextension. Menisci, unfortunately, are removed uh, in total knee and therefore they are not relevant. Now, whatever anatomy, whatever the discrepancy on the medial and lateral side and uh, the relative motion between the medial and lateral side we have seen so far, what does that result in? So if you see, these are the points uh, which are the contact points at various degrees of flexion. On the medial side, those points are very close to each other. But if you see laterally, they are very uh, up far away from each other. Which, what does it tell you? That whatever motion happens, happens on the lateral side. Now, 0 to 90 degree flexion is not a problem. The, but beyond 90, the posterior uh, condyle of the femur and tibia would start impinging on each other. To prevent that, there is something called as a rollback, where this point of contact moves back and the posterior groove on the, between the shaft and the posterior condyle accommodates the posterior tibial uh, condyle. And this allows around 20 to 30 degrees of more flexion. So this is what rollback is. So just to highlight the rollback, I'll show you this video. Now this video very clearly uh, shows us the rollback phenomenon. So if you see, traditionally rollback has been attributed only to PCL, but if you see here, it during flexion, it is the ACL that, now I'll just show, come to it again. Yeah. So once we start flexing, if you see the ACL is actually pulling the femur forward. And during extension, it is the PCL that pulls the femur back into position. I hope you could appreciate that. Uh, the femur and tibia are moving on each other. Now whether the femur moves on the tibia or the tibia moves on the femur depends on what uh, activity one is doing. So if you are standing on ground, the tibia is going to be fixed and the femur is going to move on the tibia. But if you are sitting on a chair and doing your knee flexion extension, the tibia is going to move on the femur. So there is no fixed rule. It all depends on the activity that we are doing. And if you think that in isolation, ACL and PCL were doing their job, it's not so simple. So this figure further highlights, it's a crossbar linkage which together is responsible for the rollback, not just ACL or not just PCL. They both together have to work to create the rollback that we see in a normal knee. So just to highlight, it's a crossbar linkage, not just an isolation. Why is the rollback important? Rollback stabilizes the patella, gives you more flexion beyond 90 degrees, uh, it, uh, and increases the contact area of the femur and the tibia and prevents wear. Besides this, there is something called as a screw home mechanism. So what happens in terminal 5 to 10 degrees of uh, extension is that there is a relative rotation between the femur and the tibia. Again, depends on whether you are standing or sitting. But this rotation, what it does is it tightens up the cruciates and the collaterals and because of which it increases the stability of the knee. And that is important because that will offload your quadriceps. So they are, when you are in extension, suppose you are standing uh, for a long time in the same position, the cordyceps don't have to fire repeatedly because the knee is locked and the cordyceps are relieved. Because if it was not for this mechanism, the cordyceps would have fatigued very early. Not to, now coming to the, mechan uh, the axes that uh, are relevant to total knee replacement. So the anatomical axis is the long axis of the uh, diaphysis of the femur and the mechanical axis as we all know is the midpoint of the uh, knee to the midpoint of the hip. The angle between these two is called the anatomical mechanical axis angle, AMA. And why is it relevant? We'll come to it later on. God has been a little kinder with us on the tibial side. He's kept both the axes as the same. So there's not much problem there. Now, the distal uh, uh, articular surface of the femur makes an angle of around 3 degree valgus to the uh, anatomical axis of the, uh, sorry, the mechanical axis of the femur. And the uh, joint line of the tibia is in 3 degree of varus with respect to the mechanical axis of femur. The valgus on the knee with the varus on the tibia together give us a parallel oblique joint line, which is not exactly perpendicular as you see, it is oblique in nature. Now the anatomical mechanical axis is going to determine the valgus angle that you set to uh, get your uh, femoral component perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Just to highlight that the AMA is uh, in short statured females and males, it is on the higher side and in tall and thin patients, it's on the lower side, the average being five to seven degrees. So when I give five to seven degrees of valgus uh, to the femoral component, that is when it will sit perpendicular to my 
mechanical axis. So that is what I wanted to see. So the tibia cut, you take it perpendicular to the mechanical axis of tibia. The femoral cut is taken perpendicular to the mechanical axis of femur, and that gives you a balanced uh, parallel and a balanced extension gap. Of course, this is after balancing your soft tissues. Now for the flexion gap, the tibial cut remains the same. What changes is the articulating surface on the femur, and it is the posterior condyles of the femur that uh, articulate in flexion. Now if I need to get this parallel flexion gap, I need to cut the medial and lateral condyles with the jig rotated externally so that I get parallel uh, gap on the flexion side. Now how much do I rotate? What are my landmarks? So these are the landmarks that determine the femoral rotation. The trans epicondylar axis, the white sides line and the posterior condylar line. These are the landmarks that you use to determine your flexion. It is, it is individual to uh, the particular patient, but it can vary from as less as minus two to as much as seven degrees. And that is the ultimate goal that you want to achieve. A flexion and an extension gap which is balanced and equal and uh, so that that is how your knee is going to fun uh, function well. One of the most uh, neglected aspects of uh, knee biomechanics is, and especially when doing TKR, is maintaining the joint line. So if you see, the joint line is approximately seven uh, millimeters from the tip of the fibular head. This is the joint line. And as a knee replacement surgeon, it is my job to maintain the joint line as close as possible to this native joint line. Only and only then will the patellar height, the relative patellar height be restored and that is how the patellofemoral kinematics will uh, work well. If there is a significant change in the joint line, either distally or proximally, it negatively impacts the patellar uh, function. Just a minute more. Uh, last but not the least, one of the most important factors that determines your patellofemoral kinematics is your implant rotation, uh, the tibial uh, tray rotation with respect to the tibial articular surface. And the landmarks are PCL on the posterior aspect and the junction of the medial one-third and lateral two-third of the tibial tuberosity on the anterior aspect. So if your tibial tuberosity, uh, your tibial implant is placed in correct rotation along with the correct rotation of the femur, that gives you a good Q angle and that helps to restore the uh, patellofemoral uh, biomechanics. So after having seen all the intricacies of the biomechanics of the knee, after having understood uh, that every structure uh, has a role to play in the biomechanics and none of the structures by isolation can work. They always work together with each other. So can your knee replacement replace the biomechanics of the knee? The answer is a big no. You are removing the ACL, you are removing the meniscus, you are converting the asymmetrical condyles to symmetrical condyles. Some of you may be using single radius designs whereas the native knee is multi-radius. Uh, you are using mechanical alignment and changing the joint line obliquity. And after all of this, you have the audacity to say that this knee will uh, act with the, uh, uh, the biomechanics of this knee will be similar to the normal knee. Uh, personally, I feel it's not going to happen. Even with cruciate retaining designs, the uh, P, uh, cruciate retaining surgeons feel that we have retained the PCL and that biomechanics is going to be uh, as good as the normal knee. We've already seen that the rollback is not the function of the PCL in isolation. It is the crossbar linkage between the PCL and the ACL. So, uh, I mean, if you just keep the PCL and expect that the rollback is going to be physiological, it is not. And it has been proven with literature that uh, the difference, there is no significant difference between a PS or a CR knee when it comes to uh, clinical outcomes. So, my idea to, uh, uh, to share the knowledge of biomechanics and the intricate anatomy of the knee is one needs to understand that at its best, total knee replacement is a compromise. Insal and Scott, who are the founders of the total knee replacement, have very clearly said the only aim of uh, TKR is to give a stable, painless knee, a long-lasting knee with which the patient can perform their activities of daily living, nothing more. Please do, not set your expect, uh, please do not set the expectations of your patients to something wrong. Keep them to minimum. Uh, of course, kinematic alignments uh, are, uh, the philosophy of kinematic alignment aims to uh, come close to the biomechanics of the knee, but yet I think we still have a long way to go. Thank you for your attention.